welcome back, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the coffee break. Thanks again, Lithuanian Airports, for sponsoring this coffee break. Massively appreciate it. Uh, the next panel will, will be moderated by Jerry Fulton, partner at Midas Aviation. And uh, we just love working with Midas Aviation. We had John Grant moderating the previous panel. We had Becca Rowan with us yesterday at the Air Service Development Workshop we designed specifically for the tourism boards. And earlier this year, we formed up uh, Aviadev Consult powered by Midas Aviation. So in July this year, I was in Mozambique uh, with John Howell at uh, an aviation conference. And one of the best speakers at that conference was a gentleman called Miguel Southwell. And he's the former CEO of uh, Atlanta Airport as we all know, the biggest airport in the world. And he shared his top 10 recommendations for the airports if they want to be successful in route development. And one of these top 10 recommendations was you need to hire a great consultant. So we sorted, out, so we sorted that uh, one out for you with Aviative Consult. So uh, Midas is here. They have a table in the meeting room, so you can uh, meet them this afternoon and, of course, tomorrow as well. And uh, yeah, that's enough for me for now. And JJ, please come on the stage. Well, thank you, Uri, for that uh, very positive uh, introduction. Uh, we're delighted to be here. Um, we're not going to monopolize the proceedings, I promise. Well, maybe just, just a little. Um, let me introduce my panel. I'm, I'm delighted to be joined, um, not least by um, another woman to balance up the gender of uh, the panels here. Um, I've got Taya Jentz joining me from um, Tallinn Airport. She's network development there. Please have a seat. I'm also pleased to be joined by Eustas uh, Rinkievicius, I think I got that right, um, Route Development Manager from Lithuanian Airports. Um, we then have uh, Luke Hayhoe, Business Development Director from Stobart Aviation, representing South End. And lastly, but by no means least, um, I have Detlev uh, Dobrothin from um, Manager Aviation and Marketing from Münster Osnabrück. So, how to turn around route development challenges? We're going to talk about some case studies to um, try and answer that and to try and give um, the, the audience some insight into some of the work um, and the, the effort that goes into securing um, new routes but also responding when things go wrong as unfortunately they, they often do um, in this industry and it sort of feels like at the moment um, perhaps more than, than ever. We've heard uh, this morning about the challenging conditions, but also some positives um, in terms of uh, profitability for airport airlines, certainly, at regional airports. Um, I think it's really timely that we take a look at how some regional airports are responding to some of these challenges. Um, it, it, as I've said, route development can feel a bit like a turbulent journey. I think other times it feels like a never-ending uh, journey that you're on and some of the examples that the panel are going to share um, will, will resonate, I'm sure, with many of you in the audience. Um, they're going to share some really interesting examples of where they've faced difficult, difficult or tricky challenges. Um, I think without further ado, we'll, we'll, we'll jump right in. Um, I'm really interested, uh, Detlev, in how you have dealt with what must have felt like a sort of continual cycle of challenge. So no sooner had you recovered from losing Air Berlin, who were a significant part of your business in 2017, than you were faced with another challenge earlier this year. Um, can you talk to us a bit about, about that? Yeah, so at the beginning, um, we were a very strong Air Berlin airport, Münster Osnabrück. Um, in a very attractive catchment area, so we have a very big market um, close to the Dutch border and close to Lower Saxony and also Northern Westphalia, the most populated area in Germany. And as all might know, Air Berlin was dedicated especially on, on, on regional airports and we're flying from, from smaller airports. Um, and uh, you know what happened with Air Berlin, there were 25 years at Münster Airport with um, uh, seven based aircraft and uh, yeah, then they went into trouble 
and they reduced um, more and more the um, presence at the smaller regional airports and they they transformed and, and to go to larger airports. They bought LTU and then they were in Düsseldorf very strong and they reduced more and more in our region. So Münster Osnabrück was not directly affected by the bankruptcy of Air Berlin, but they reduced already the years before. And for us it was a challenge to find a replacement for, uh, for Air Berlin and we found this replacement in the German carrier Germania. Germania was also very strong for, for 30 years at Münster Airport, but more or less as a charter carrier but they transformed themselves uh, after Air Berlin reduced in the region into a hybrid schedule carrier, open for tour operators, open for schedule flights and so on. And then we developed the market with Germania, which filled the gaps Air Berlin uh, left. And that was a very good situation for us over the last years. And then very unexpectedly, uh, also Germania, so the successor uh, of Air Berlin uh, in this market also failed this year. Um, and so we had, uh, were forced in, in February. This was February, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was so in February. It was on the 5th of February, um, but it was very unexpected. So yeah. um, uh, everybody knows any airline has uh, had some problems, so of course, but everybody knows uh, or think um, this will be solved, especially when you have high booking numbers for the summer schedule. Yeah. Having got through the winter, yeah, you, yeah. you sort of anticipate the summer is, is okay. Yeah, that's right. So and, and especially in February, you have already the pre-bookings mm. for the summer. And so we were absolutely sure that Germania is safe, but unexpectedly they failed then on the 5th of February. And for us, the next challenge was to find a replacement of Germania as well. And we succeeded within just four weeks from the Germania failure to the contract with Corendon Airlines, Corendon um, uh, Turkey and Corendon Europe to take over a lot of flights. They did not take over the entire capacity and did not operate into any destination Germania did before or planned before. But from 26% market share Germania had in 2018, we will just suffer with minus 5 to 6% in the entire result so of passenger a, number for 2019. They filled a big part yeah. of that yeah. hole then. That's right. And how, how, how were you, what was it about your relationship with Corindon that meant you could turn that on within four weeks. What, what, what happened there? Um, the reason was that we are always in talk with any carrier. So we have a very good relationship to a lot of carriers, especially also to, to Corendon Airlines, mm -hmm. the Corendon Group. And they were flying from Münster to Antalya um, a couple of years ago. And they were interested in operating or resuming flights from Münster Airport. But due to the strong presence of Germania and other carriers in the market, they were a little bit afraid to start something at Münster Airport, but the relationship continues. And after the demise of Germania, we had a chance to, to pick up these discussions with Corendon, and then they stepped into that and, and could uh, realize their plans they originally had. So they saw it as an opportunity for, yeah. for, for them. Yeah. How did your market respond to uh, you know, a third operator in, in mm. two or three years? That was a very challenging thing. So you must know that our market is very related to German carrier. Abelin is a German carrier, Germania is a German carrier, so the people were well known. A German airline is flying me to mostly touristic destinations, but then a Turkish-Dutch carrier appeared and a lot of people did not know the name of Corendon and did not know the brand of them but they showed very fast that they are very reliable, that they operate very stable, uh, no cancellations, no delays, and um, they were flying since the 12th of April uh, with a very reliable program, and they were flying also very successful at our airport, and they have already announced to expand in 2020 um, by 30% from the capacity, and so we are very happy to, to, to have Corendon at our airport as a replacement. So you'll be hoping for some stability uh, going, going forward for the next 12 Absolutely. months. Well, we, we, we can't, yeah. uh, nothing, nothing is ever certain. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Thea, I'm going to uh, ask you to, to come in now because you had a similar experience, didn't you? Not, not perhaps quite as drastic, um, but you'd worked very hard to secure um, a, a service to Heathrow that was an important, um, important to your local stakeholders, um, and that, that didn't quite pan out how you hoped it would, did it? Yeah, it's, um, it was definitely a tricky situation for us. I mean, first of all, London has been by far one of the highest point-to-point -point, uh, destinations out of uh, Estonia for many years, and uh, also 
my team at the airport has for many years worked actually to increase frequencies and get other carriers to fly to London. I think a few years ago we just had there two carriers. Um, and now, within a span of uh, two, three years, it went on to having five different carriers. Um, everyone uh, flying with the same kind of business model. Obviously, Italian is very far from London, so you have really high seat cost. You have to have the right aircraft to operate that profitably. And um, with this low frequency product that those other four carriers had on the market, at that time it was three carriers, we were hoping that British Airways would be the one uh, who would actually come in and serve the business, uh, business segment. Um, unfortunately, and it's probably something that airlines and airports are constantly discussing, discussing uh, with each other, it's like this chicken and egg problem that we're not going to add more frequencies until we see a better result on a product. Then again, you have to have a better product in order to be more viable. Um, and with competition, viable. then exactly. it's even harder. Yeah. Exactly. So basically what happened was that uh, um, competing against low-cost carriers, having obviously a much higher cost base, um, gave us the signal that this product is most likely not sustainable in the long run. Um, also at the same time, other carriers came to the market as well. So we had ended up with five carriers on the London market with very, very similar products. Um, so yeah, at the end of the day, uh, somebody had to pull out and unfortunately that was uh, BA. Um, but at the same time, the development that we've seen overall on the point-to-point -point, point -point London market is that actually they managed to increase significantly uh, the passenger numbers and also on the indirect segment as well as the direct market. So it's sort of like a situation where, yes, it was a very unfortunate decision by BA, but actually overall it has definitely increased our market to UK a lot. And how did you balance that message with the stakeholders? Because it was, it was the Heathrow BA service that, that was on their target list, wasn't it? Right. That, that was on their wish list. Absolutely, yeah. A lot of work went into um, also from uh, Enterprise Estonia, uh, everybody's uh, you know, time and effort in trying to market you know, Estonia as a destination, especially through BA channels, so there's a lot of investment in that. Uh, but at the end of the day, we all have to realize that, I mean, airlines are the ones who are taking the most risk uh, in starting a new operation. So often we don't have much to say when they have this kind of uh, really simple cost revenue situations and decisions to make. Okay. And that managing relationships with stakeholders resonates with you, Yassas, doesn't it? Um, yes. You, you had an interesting time when you were um, trying to pursue a new service from Palanga to Dortmund, I think. Yeah, that's right. Basically, you know, I've not, not speaking about the Dortmund-Palanga route, but in general, you know, speaking mm. about the, all the new destinations which we are currently launching out, out of Lithuanian airports, you know, if we, we look into all the, you know, past things which was done by the airports and our stakeholders. So not that long, not, not that long ago, you know, uh, we've been always hearing the question from our stakeholders that, you know, they were saying that it's airport's fault that we, we don't have a proper connectivity uh, all across the Europe out of our airports. So um, we did quite quite a big job uh, during the past three, three or four years. Uh, because at, at this time we already have uh, more than 20 active uh, stakeholders who, who are, you know, into the all route development process. And you have seven different municipalities, don't you? Uh, yes, yeah, so to, that's, to th th that's for Palanga <laughs> Dortmund route. So, yes, yeah, seven different municipalities act as one association and they dedicate a, a budget for, for the route development. So basically, you know, what is good for us and, you know, what we achieved this year especially, you know, that we have 50-50 balance, you know, the money for the support for the airlines, you know, from our side and which comes from, from, from our stakeholders. So this year in total, we invested around 14 million euros. So, you know, 7 million came from the airport side and other 7 million com comes from our stakeholders. So this allowed to, even this year to launch free routes dedicated, you know, uh, what, with which one, on which we work to go together with our stakeholders and, you know, we are not planning to stop. So That, bring, yeah. that brings challenge though, doesn't it, I, I guess, when, when you're trying to bring together your aspirations in terms of where you want to see growth happening and your stakeholders' aspirations. Did you, um, h how hard was that process of getting to the point where you could sit down together and say our collective targets are? 
So yeah, we, we had many and many, many meetings with them. So currently, you know, it's, I would say, you know, at Maybe this stage. Maybe more than with the airlines? I, I would say yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <okay. laughs> Because, yeah, we don't need to fly to meet our stakeholders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, you know, we are traveling by car all across the Lithuania and speaking with them. But yeah, at this stage, uh, almost each and every stakeholder has a short list of their wish list uh, of, of, of destinations on which we are working together. We as an airport, we have much more of them, but still we, we have, you know, focus uh, destinations where we have specific stakeholder which might be supporting that route. So this was the idea of our blitz sessions, which we started, you know, last year, where we're <laughs> inviting airlines to come to Vilnius and to meet us and our stakeholders, where we are, you know, during one day we are discussing everything through and, in <coughs> And by the end of the day, we are already coming up with uh, uh, possible solutions, how we are, you know, uh, how much we're investing and uh, into which fields of, of route development we are investing together with our stakeholders. So the value of proposals, it's quite big, you know, we estimate that each and every route, you know, gets quite a lot of money, you know, not from our side, there's um, incentives, but also the various support from our stakeholder side. So spending that time was really valuable then to, to refine your list and to, to actually identify who your targets were. Yeah, were and especially, be. you know, during the, the joint meetings with, with our stakeholders, you know, even the stakeholders started to speak with one each other and they discovered they are doing a lot of similar things in the same market. So they are currently teaming up, not only the road development side, but also attracting tourism or new business into Lithuania and they started to work together. And it was, this was, you know, basically done by, by us once we, you know, said, guys, we need to, you know, work very specifically and, and, and together just, you know, to achieve the best results. Excellent. I think it's really, it, it, it's really key, isn't it, managing that relationship. It's just such a critical part of, uh, of what you do. Look, it wouldn't be fair to, um, to to put too much pressure on you to come up with uh, to come up with an with an example, given that you've been in post for I think seven weeks. Yeah. yeah, seven weeks now. But from your from your experience, I guess you you've got examples, haven't you, of where um, you've perhaps been on the other side of the decision to to stop the service um, in in the competitive environment. It'd be great if you could share. Yes. In some terms of uh, your stopping the service, I guess. Um, good example would be um, um, when I was on the other side of the, uh, the table, um, we commenced a service uh, from London City to Stockholm, Arlanda, um, after a number of years of conversations with the, the local authorities and the airport teams, um, and we had fantastic relationships, and the time was right, and as we were growing to, to launch a new destination from Stockholm, Arlanda to London City. But um, over time, we saw huge growth in um, LCC capacity from London to uh, Stockholm. And at the same time, there was a, a few shakes with the economy, and we saw a slight reduction in, in business traffic. And one of the business, uh, difficult de decisions we had to, to take was that now we were seeing the, we were able to maintain volumes, but the yields were going down, the route profitability was just not there. So despite a number of conversations with the airport authorities, with both, both airports, it wasn't something that could be funded to continue. So that, that was a really big challenge, and a lot of it was to do with overcapacity. So I think one of the big things that we, we have to ensure um, as an airport community is that we don't deliver overcapacity on routes, because at the end of the day, we all need to make profits, both the airports and the airlines. So, so maintaining the right levels of capacity on the uh, city sets or the airport sets it is crucial in terms of keeping airlines and the airports profitable. And so that leads me, I guess, into the, the inevitable question, talking of over, over capacity, um, in your new role, yep. um, South, End, South End is growing phenomenally quickly at the moment. We, we heard uh, this morning from nothing 15 years ago, um, you know, you're now approaching 1.5 million passengers with, with growth re really continuing. How sustainable is that? So we're actually growing, we, we will hit 2.3 million uh, customers um, this year. And um, we've obviously got a new base of Ryanair with three aircraft based, um, EasyJet's continued growth. 
um, as well. And you as, have Wiz as well. Yeah, and we've got Wiz commencing this winter season. Yeah. Um, so the, I think the benefit of London South End, which hasn't previously been utilised, is is that it does have the London catchment. So it's got London and Essex catchment, and I think well, we have six airports in the London London system. And obviously, there's a lot of overlap in central London, but then each of the airports has their own distinct areas of catchment. But our catchment area at London South End is 8.2 million customers. And if you compare uh, the passenger numbers of 2.3 million uh, versus Stansted, we're, uh, we're less than 10% of Stansted's passenger number. And the train service from London South End to, to central London to Liverpool Street is exactly the same time. But the airport experience... And I think that's the little, yeah. the, the, the little known <coughs> fact, isn't it? And, yeah. and therein lies the challenge, doesn't it, to some extent? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's back to the whole awareness piece. Um, we were talking earlier on, uh, there used to be a service in Munster. I know and, that yeah. uh, Munster were very yeah. keen to, <laughs> yeah. to talk so, to you. Um, we so could have a live, in action, uh, so, um, in development conversation. But it's yeah. one of the big pieces uh, that is a common problem in regional airports is awareness. So both from a customer perspective and an airline perspective. So I, I've already realised that seven weeks in, there's a, still a big piece of work to do to promote how easy, quick and easy it is from London South End to London. It's, it's exactly the same time as Stansted, but the airport experience is so much faster. It's a small terminal, you're through the airport and on the train within 10 minutes. And the same with Hamburg Journey coming off the train and through the airport 10 minutes. So actually, it's a much quicker experience when you do a door-to-door -door journey to use London South End. And we have a range of airlines with similar routes, uh, which have all proven very popular. And so you, you, you've got to communicate that message across such a range of audiences though, haven't you? Yep. So you've got to convince the market, yep. firstly, bo both ends. Yep. Um, and you've got to convince the airlines, and you know about that because you've been that person being at the other, the other side. Um, I think, uh, Thea, you, you had an interesting experience of working with somebody at the other end, didn't you, to try and secure a, a service? Yeah, we had um, a really good example, actually, of how to cooperate together with other airports as well, which I think is becoming increasingly important when trying to, you know, do a joint business case together to get the most out of your cooperation to make it more attractive to the airline. Um, we had a case with uh, Malaga uh, that we were pursuing actually quite a few years and obviously if you know Europe then I mean Estonia is here and Malaga is here, <laughs> really far. Um, obviously again the issue with finding the suitable carrier, finding a suitable aircraft that would able to you know, uh, do that profitably. And at the end of the day, um, we uh, managed to find an agreement with Air Baltic, uh, who was thinking about that for a long time. They're very thorough, and of course, in their decision making. Um, so it was funny, they first decided to start a Riga Malaga flight. Obviously, they have bases in, uh, in three Baltic states. Which might have been predictable, I, I suppose. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So, um, I mean, it's a very risk averse decision, so they tried it to do from, uh, from Riga first. And uh, what happened was that if, if, if you went to the Riga airport, you could see in the parking lot there were lots of cars with Estonia license plates. So um, it's not that uh, far to try from, especially if you're from south of Estonia, Riga airport is quite uh, close by and obviously um, it's, it might be even more convenient for them to fly out of Riga, but uh, because of that big success and obviously airlines can see whether tickets have been purchased, uh, who, are the who are the passengers on board. So. Uh, they did take the risk and uh, decided to launch um, Tallinn Malaga flight and it has uh, exceeded everyone's expectations, even ours. So you feel vindicated yes. that uh, pursuing yes. that was continuing to pursue that despite um, a setback exactly. with, with um, them launching a, a Riga Malaga service first was it was the right thing to do. Exactly and it's especially uh, tricky for the airport. Um, as obviously when we're talking about Malaga, it's an, it's an outbound leisure destination. So, I mean, stakeholders, especially tourism bureaus in Estonia, it's not necessarily supporting business traffic per se. Um, nobody has interest in investing into taking people out of Estonia and spending their money somewhere else. So, uh, and also in terms of Spain and possible market for, for Spanish uh, tourism development, Estonia is still a very small market. So we were pretty much on our own there, 
Um, and uh, did it help having a partner at the other end of the route? Was that did that make a difference for you? It did, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, that was actually a very positive thing. That actually, we got feedback from Air Baltic as well afterwards. That wow, it's great to see you guys cooperating, and obviously, it makes the decision making to the airline a bit faster, a bit more convenient, in my opinion. Look, is that something that, that you've had experience of? Um, again, perhaps thinking back to your past experience of being approached by um, airports from, from both ends with, it, with a sort of collective picture. Is that more powerful from an airline it perspective? It definitely was powerful, yeah. It was, yeah. It, it, thinking back, that wasn't, it, it, it's happening a lot more now than it used to. It didn't used to happen uh, much, but yeah, more recently I've seen a lot more of that. And definitely, if you've got both airports on both sides, and I know the next session's about relationships and working together, so I won't talk too much about that, but it really is the, 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 the main benefit of being able to try and convince an airline to start a route. If you can have both sets of airports, both sets of tourist boards, uh, local authorities working together to, to develop a case that will, will support the losses, especially effectively in the first year, with a long-term aim of it being sustainable in its own right, then that's a fantastic approach. Okay, so you heard it here first, Ms. Munster uh, Southend, <laughs> potentially coming, <laughs> may, maybe coming soon. Um, let's change tack slightly because we've heard lots about challenges and I think you all probably have challenges, more challenges on your plate um, than, uh, than we have time to talk about. Um, Yes, we, we talked about um, you had been pursuing um, a Dubai service, hadn't you, with, with Fly Dubai, and you were hampered by the inconvenience of the 737 MAX situation. Do you want to talk to us a bit, a, a bit about that and how that's panning out for you? Yeah, basically, you know, uh, as, as Jay already mentioned, you know, a couple of times, you know, Tallinn is very far away, but yeah, Vilnius is not that, that far away in, in Europe, <laughs> but yeah, we, we're still, you know, in, in that region where the uh, operational issues of, of, of the airlines sometimes be, because it becomes a, a challenge even on, on rule development side. Uh, so, yeah, basically we have, we've been speaking to, to, to Middle East carriers quite a lot, you know, uh, about the possibility to launch a direct flight in between Lithuania and Middle East. Uh, in, in this case, yeah, it, it, it was Fly Dubai and then a couple of other carriers. So, yeah, it seemed that, you know, we are this close to, 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 to having a deal and, you know, and, you know shaking the hands I on it. I feel lots of empathy in the room here with uh, <laughs> lots of people saying, yeah, we, we know how that feels. Yeah, and, you know, suddenly uh, we, we know what, what happened to 737 Max aircraft and due to that, so, you know, uh, basically, it was uh, not, there was no commercial viability to to, to start that, that flying yeah, because uh, NG aircraft can make it to Vilnius out of Dubai, but yeah, with some some load restrictions, so that brings even more challenges to the airline to operate that route. So yeah, I, ideally, once uh, you know we we are out of uh, max um, issues. Hopefully by, by the new year, because yeah, yesterday I read an article that there are some expectations that Max aircraft will, will be flying by the new year. Hopefully in Europe, not, not only in the US. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, and, and yeah, we, we are always, you know, uh, we are in touch with, with the carriers who, who are affected by Max issues. So yeah, we understand their challenges because yeah, personally I'm also coming from the airline. Uh, so I previously used to work for, for the airline I do understand, you know, how it hurts when you have to replace your existing operation simply once you don't have the enough capacity for your planned flying program. So, yeah, I, I really feel for them and I hope that, you know, we will be having that service quite soon. Okay. Let's Unless watch. you get that first. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's watch this space. So, so finding the right operator with the right equipment is, is absolutely key, isn't it, yes. to, um, to, to achieving success. Um, Detlev, you, you um, are trying to pursue um, some domestic connectivity, aren't you, at, at the moment? Um, you've got a Dutch carrier who are operating, um, they've announced they're operating a Berlin service, haven't they? Yeah, so, so many people say the regional aviation uh, with smaller aircraft is almost dead. 
Mm -hmm. um, uh, many predict that, but um, in our I case... I think some of the previous panel <laughs> might, might disagree yeah. with that. <laughs> but, but, with, but with very small aircraft. We don't yeah. speak about 50 seaters or 30 seaters. So um, in the Netherlands, there is a carrier called AIS Airlines, and they have 19-seater turboprop aircraft. And that is a business model which is very, um, uh, yeah, not, not, not so many popular in Europe anymore. Um, let's say 20 or 30 years ago, you had a lot of 19-seaters flying around, more, a lot of regional services, some of them um, picked up with larger aircraft, others were cancelled at least. Um, and um, when, when you count the carriers who still operate 19-seater aircraft, you can, you can count it on one hand, at, at least in Europe. Um, and then in the Netherlands, there is AIS Airlines. They are operating 10 British Aerospace Jetstream 32 aircraft. And they have based one at Münster Osnabrück since six years already, and they're operating the Stuttgart route. Um, at the beginning, we were also a little bit cautious. Can it work? Um, uh, high fare? Um, more business model, so you know with a 19-seater you have very high uh, seat costs and um, the, the fares are not cheap, So, but uh, um, uh, especially business travelers who are uh, uh, willing to fly in the morning to their business destination and return in the evening, avoid an overnight and avoid a very long journey by train or by car, for them they are, they are buying not a flight, they are buying time with that Fair and it works well. It's a small community, and the break even with it with this aircraft and the average fare um, is at 10 passengers per flight. And uh, they show uh, already since six years that it works. And now they will expand uh, services from Münster Osnabrück. They now have introduced from the 2nd of September a Copenhagen route, um, uh, and in combination with Groningen. And uh, the next step is from the 4th of November, they will start also a Berlin route and basing a third aircraft at our airport. Um, and so it is, like you say, uh, the right sized aircraft and the right sized business model with the right airline for the right route. And at the moment, this is the solution for that because we were trying to find also other carriers operating into Berlin, but there is also a very strong train competition. Um, and uh, this is the right size aircraft and the right size business model for this route. But we also have other scheduled flights, of course. Lufthansa is very, uh, has a very strong presence at our market. For an airport like us, with roughly one million passengers per year, last year slightly above, this year slightly below, uh, we have um, uh, nine flights per day with Lufthansa, which is also unusual. So it's a very high Lufthansa presence. Um, and some direct scheduled flights on the business uh, routes are now operated by AIS Airlines with, on this way with a smaller aircraft. So you're balancing, you, you know, you know we, I think we heard earlier uh, also about, um, you know, often um, regional airports are dominated by one carrier or um, have a very large proportion of capacity operated by them. But it sounds as if you're balancing um, different types of carriers. Mm -hmm. and, and I wonder, look, for, for South End going forward, you're obviously riding the wave at the moment of the low-cost carrier expansion that, that's happening, and there's a question about how, where that goes yep. um, that you know, we could have a whole separate conversation about. But wh where do you see the rest of your market? Is, is that the future for Southend, or is there a whole raft of other things? So South End will, uh, London Southend will predominantly be low-cost, mm -hmm. um, focused on leisure, VFR, but there are opportunities which are outside of that. Um, we already have a flyby operation operated by Stobart Air at the moment, which will obviously become Virgin Connect going forward. So we're, of course, talking to, to them as well about the future network uh, opportunities from, uh, from the London South End. So th there are other opportunities, but it will predominantly be a leisure-focused uh, LCC airport. Again, when I say leisure, not just leisure, I mean VFR as well. Um, Again, we were talking earlier, we've, we've got no Vilnius service at the moment. I was just about to, uh, <laughs> to say, you know, <laughs> like my, um, ne my next question. <laughs> so we'll have, uh, but we'll have two Vilnius services because uh, Wiz and Ryanair will both commence um, this year. And again, that comes to overcapacity, but actually East London, Essex is actually, uh, there's a huge proportion of uh, Lithuanians based and living in and around there. So there, there will, that is one route that should be able to support both carriers with the frequencies they're operating. I'd be very interested in your view on that, yes. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, so basically, Vilnius South End route, um, a as we see it, you know, it will be very beneficial for Lithuanian community who is living in, in, in that area of, of UK and London, uh, because, um, you know, uh, historically, we have very big community of Lithuanian South there, and, you know, increasing the connectivity um, with, with, with UK, uh, that, you know, al allows us, you know, not even to focus only on VFR route or VFR traffic, but, but also, you know, to, to have the British tourism coming in into Lithuania as well, because uh, all of our stakeholders who are responsible for, for tourism development of Lithuania, they are focused on UK market quite a lot. Unfortunately, yeah, businesses, uh, as we see it, you know, they, they don't want to, you know, to, to travel by low-cost carriers. So, uh, ben to, to, to benefit their needs, uh, this year we launched uh, Vilnius London City Road, which will, will be very successful. Actually, it uh, already brought uh, big investors uh, to, to, to make a decision to open their FDI, um, yeah, to do the FDIs into Vilnius region. So, yeah, Moody's and Forbes decided to open up their offices and shared centers in Vilnius. So, we are very proud of that. And the main idea of uh, London City Flight was. Uh, that we didn't have any proper co connectivity with uh, the biggest airports in London, so we didn't have London Gatwick and London Heathrow or LCY, so that was a huge, uh, you know, driver for us and to our stakeholders, you know, first of all, to, to have a proper discussion with uh, European Commission to allow us to launch a PSO scheme on, on this route, because normally in Europe, yeah, we have PSOs uh, only, you know, for, 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 for the regional flights, you know, to connect islands with, with a mainland. Peripheral, uh, peripheral yeah. geographic locations, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, we've managed <laughs> to come, you know, to, to, you know, to point out to European Commission that, you know, we are also that region which lacks of connectivity and we are losing a lot of uh, direct uh, investment from, from UK, uh, basically not having it. So there were the, the main factors which allowed us, you know, to launch a PSO scheme. I'm very happy that, you know, a lot of Polish airlines operating that route. And it seems that the airline is also quite, you know, quite optimistic about the route itself. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I do believe that it will bring e even more um, investments into Lithuania by, by having that flight. But, yeah, uh, South End um, also will, will be very beneficial for us as well because Num number one, you know, country as a destination uh, out of Lithuania is UK, and num number one city with the biggest portion of passengers out of Lithuania is London. So, and th there are still gaps uh, to be filled on 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 that uh, on that route. So that process of securing a PSO for a route into effectively a mainstream airport can't have been easy. How how did you go about that? How how challenging was that to to Basically, it took us around two years uh, once we've, you know, started to plan everything. So one year was uh, basically, you know, uh, a lot of homework from our side and negotiations with, with European Commission. So, yeah, m myself and my colleagues here, yeah, we were traveling to Brussels quite, <laughs> quite often uh, at that time. So, yeah, one year, you know, just to prepare everything in a correct way to, you know, uh, to convince them to do that. And afterwards, there was another year you know, to, to prepare ourselves to the project itself, you know, to, to work on an agreement, you know, to have the, all the KPIs which has to be matched, you know, to decide on, on, on the, you know, possible uh, uh, frequencies of a flight and so on and so forth. So, yeah, it, it was quite a big project, yeah, but uh, we... And there must, there must have been times in that journey, perhaps at the beginning, where you were thinking, is, is this really going to be possible? Are we, are we going to achieve this? Or did you sort of have faith from the outset? It Basically, yeah, we had faith since day one, because yeah, we, we saw all the potential, yeah. and we had very, very, one very strong uh, stakeholder, which is called Invest Lithuania, who is responsible for attracting new businesses into our country. So we uh, teamed up with them. Uh, we had a support from government as well. Yeah, because, you know, we are a governmental institution and Invest Lithuania is also a governmental institution. So basically two ministries, Ministry of Trans Transport and another Ministry of Economy uh, of Lithuania, you know, they teamed up as well. So we had a uh, big support.
support you know in, in political level because some even some some legislative acts of Lithuania had to be changed in order to launch the PSO scheme successfully so there was a huge job done yeah maybe there were some you know some timings where we thought that okay maybe it's a dead end but yeah somehow we managed you know to, to, to go through all the process and quite successfully well, well done, because I think that's an, uh, an incredible achievement to, to have to have actually, you know, understood that you knew there was a market, you were convinced, and actually you, you found um, perhaps a, you know, slightly creative way to get there, but but actually you, you got the desired result in the end. I think that's a fantastic example of yeah. um, the, the, the sort of persistence and resilience that all of you need and, and all of you um, need to, to deploy every day um, in, in the kind of challenges that you face. Um, Thea, you, you've got a, a, a sort of present challenge, haven't you, with Munich? That's, a, that's something that's been burning, burning away for you. I think you're happy to talk about it. Yes, uh, uh, gladly. Um, We've, uh, we've had a really good run at Tallinn Airport in terms of uh, growth in passenger numbers. Uh, over the last couple of years, we've grown in double digits and uh, obviously the, the base for growing is getting more harder and harder. We have all of our you know, core routes covered. Um, so we are in, in that sense in a quite a nice position where we have a really balanced portfolio uh, between hub carriers and, and, and the low cost uh, carriers. The balance is really healthy in our in our, in our opinion. Um, at the same time, we do have a situation where our domestic carrier uh, Nordica has decided to uh, to not operate commercial flights under its own name anymore. Meaning that that was a quite a significant re reduction in capacity that we were planning to have next year. Um, so a majority of this year actually has been um, has been going the efforts that we have been put into is to find replacements to those routes. Um, it's especially um, difficult coming back again to this leisure, uh, leisure topic. We Estonians, we love you know, warm weather and it's really nice to be here in, uh, in Valencia when the sun is out, etc. <laughs> uh, we, we don't get much, uh, much sun up, up in the north, so, um, so one of the biggest uh, uh, obstacles that we see that we don't have a carrier that would operate seasonal summer destinations. And that's actually one of, um, one of really good you know, market op opportunities for, um, for, for us and where we actually can see where um, low cost market share uh, has room to grow in Estonia. Um, and uh, also finding replacements for, for, for flights that we didn't have before. And I think one of the really, uh, really good examples that we have, which is a rather unprecedented example, is that Lufthansa, who is uh, serving Tallinn um, three times a day, uh, to via Frankfurt actually has decided to, uh, to put back flights on Munich Tallinn route. It's again something that we were working really hard to get. and. Uh, if you have a market, they can see that you have 100,000 passengers a year, uh, which are just left stranded. In a sense, uh, it's 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 not a case you have to think too too much on, uh, especially considering that um, Lufthansa, Lufthansa will have a really good chance to also strengthen their uh, Frankfurt product even further and increase presence in Estonia. Uh, but for us, that's definitely one of um, one of the major milestones as well, trying to uh, trying to replace the um, the seats that we will not have uh, next year. Otherwise, our growth numbers would be even nicer. Thank you uh, for that. So I think, you know, it's, we've heard a lot about just having to respond to changes in the dynamics in, in the markets before um, or earlier today and, and, uh, and now. And I think um, it strikes me that you always have to be looking for those opportunities, don't you? You always have to have your plan B, your plan C, and maybe sometimes your plan D um, up, up your sleeve to, to, to actually um, perhaps try and anticipate where, uh, where capacity is going to come from um, and, and do all of those things. Um, I think we're almost running out of time. Um, so I think we have time just for, if anybody in the audience has a burning question that they'd like to ask any of the, um, the panel, then please, uh, please speak now. Anyone? No? Okay, well, I would like to just say thank you very much to you all for sharing um, and being open about 
the successes and challenges that you've uh, been anticipating. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Deirdre.